K, a personal preference kit, had to be very small, limited in weight. It was vacuum packed. What I had done, and most did, was you canvassed uh, family members, friends, to what you might carry for them. Neil Armstrong's kit, though, wasn't detailed in any mission reports. It may have included a personal item in memory of his daughter Karen, passed away at two and a half years old. Neil had lost a little girl, and he called her Muffy. Well, one of the craters on the moon that he walked over to was, he called it a baby crater, and he named it Muffy's Crater. He also left something of Muffy's on the moon. I know what it is, but I have never shared that with anyone because Neil told me in confidence, and I'll never break that confidence. Very few people know what Neil Armstrong left on the moon for his daughter, Muffy. When he died on August 25th, 2012, at 82 years old, the astronaut took this secret, along with many others, to the grave. Right or wrong, these secrets continue adding to the legend that began almost 45 years earlier in the middle of July. July 16, 1969. At 9.32 in the morning in Florida, an immense crowd gathered around the official stands at Cape Kennedy. Some camped on site so as not to miss the event. You had over a million people that had surrounded the Cape. They couldn't cram in anymore, clogging the roads and everything. 3,500 journalists traveled from 55 countries to witness one event, the liftoff of the Saturn V rocket destined to bring three men to the moon. At the top of the rocket, more than 300 feet in the air, seated on the equivalent of 540 tons of TNT, three astronauts await the countdown. The crew was in a tiny cabin all the way at the very top. In other words, just 1% of all that lifted off was actually used for the mission to the moon and back. Outside of the atomic bomb, at the moment when it lifted off, the Saturn V rocket made the loudest sound ever recorded by a man-made object. At the time of the Apollo 4 launch in 1967, the vibrations were so strong that three miles away, the ceiling tiles in the press area fell down and the windows vibrated. As they watched the incredible rocket disappearing in the blue Florida sky, no one was thinking any longer about the challenge faced by the Saturn V designers. But we do not intend to because when Kennedy launched America toward conquering the moon in the early 1960s, it didn't seem that such a machine could see the light of day. In 1961, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union had rockets powerful enough to send astronauts to the moon and bring them all the way back to Earth. No rocket like this had ever been constructed, and people weren't entirely sure that it could work. To succeed at such a feat, America would stop at nothing, including enlisting the help of the one who surely was alone in the ability to design such a device, and who would be named director of NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Werner von Braun, a brilliant German engineer, who was also a supporter of Adolf Hitler. Werner von Braun is a complicated historical figure. He was a Nazi. The people who came over with him all worked for the Nazi cause. They knew a lot about building rockets. They built the V-2 in World War II. That's the first ballistic missile that had any capability. Warner von Braun put his skills at NASA's disposal, just as he had several years earlier for the Nazi dictatorship. But without him, America would certainly never have been able to develop the most powerful rocket in history and beat the Soviets. The result was mind-boggling. Saturn V was 363 feet tall with the command and service module and 33 feet wide. The Saturn V was a monster of a rocket. No launch vehicle since the Apollo moon landings has equaled um, the power and capability of the Saturn V. 
When the final stage of the rocket left terrestrial orbit to go to the moon, the crew had to manage a very delicate procedure. The command and service module made a 180-degree rotation while in space and redocked with the Eagle, the lunar module, so it would be pointed.